Speaker Newt Gingrich earned a PhD in history from Tulane University. Speaker Gingrich is the author of 23 books, uh, 13 of which were New York Times bestseller, principally on history and politics. Uh, he's also the producer of several award-winning documentary films, on history, uh, many of which are on history and politics as well. He was a history professor for eight years at West Georgia College. He's also the longest serving teacher at the Joint War Fighting Course for Major Generals at the Air University and taught officers from all five services as an honorary distinguished visiting scholar and professor at the National Defense University. Speaker Gingrich represented Georgia in Congress for 20 years, including four as the Speaker of the United States House of Representatives. Speaker Gingrich is currently making a bid, as you all know, for the Republican presidential nomination for 2012, and it is amazing that he takes this time to spend with us, given what he has to do. I, it, it is a great honor and a pleasure to introduce a great American, Speaker Newt Gingrich. Let me first of all thank you, Mallory. This is, I think this is a terrific concept of a course. I think the fact that you're going to have an entire video series which will be available to anybody who ever wants to understand the origins and evolution of modern conservatism is a real contribution. Uh, I looked at the, uh, the list of guest speakers, and it's, a, it's an honor to be in that list. You have, you have some of the great figures of modern conservatism talking to the students at the Citadel. So uh, this is a terrific opportunity. The, the uh, period we're going to talk about, uh, my particular assignment from, from Mallory, is uh, in many ways the richest uh, and most important period because it's almost the DNA of modern America and, and the way in which we have evolved since then. Uh, and I say that with the exception maybe of Lincoln's resurrection of the Declaration of Independence, there's no period after uh, 1800 that is quite as dynamic intellectually in setting the stage for the America that evolved uh, during that period. I'm, I want to put it in a historic context in a couple different directions, so if you'll bear with me. Uh, I want you to think of this as a story in which there were a group of people who discovered themselves being in a particular situation. They, weren't, they didn't go out intellectually in a French Cartesian model and draw lines and say, oh, this is all logical. They were living a life of freedom. They were living a life of community. They were living a life of self-government. They were living a life of enormous practicality. And all of a sudden, the British Empire began to disrupt their ability to continue living that life. And you have to see the American Revolution in a remarkable way as a conservative reaction to British imperial tyranny, actually protecting a past status quo. Unlike the French Revolution, the American revolutionaries aren't trying to rebel to create a different future. They're trying to, to sustain what they see as a powerful past. Uh, there are a couple of reasons this occurs. Part of it is captured by uh, Samuel Johnson in his wonderful Oxford History of the English People, the English-speaking people, where he said, or the, I'm sorry, his History of the Americans in the Oxford series, where he says, by the 1770s, the Americans were probably the lowest taxed people in the history of the human race, and they resented every penny. And I, I think it was this, this, this is at the core, I'm going to talk a lot about DNA today, because I think it's a useful organizing model for how real Americans have acculturated and why we can absorb people from other countries. And literally in a matter of years, they can learn to be American in a way that you never learn to be French or to be German or to be Chinese. Uh, the, the America has a unique uh, intellectual and cultural DNA. So, so here's part of the story. There are, there are two overlapping realities uh, work. One is a very long evolution of a British sense of, or an English sense of uh, personal freedom, going back in many ways to the Magna Carta, uh, in some ways going all the way back to Anglo and, uh, Anglo and Saxon laws preceding the Norman invasion. So there's a, there's a long sense of individuality and a long sense of individual rights and that I have some rights that even the king can't take from me. And, by, of course, by the Magna Carta in 1215, the barons are actually getting the king to sign a document that says there are certain rights he can't take from them, and he can't get extra money without their approval. Now, early on, this is actually a deal for the, the, for the great lords, but it gradually, over hundreds of years, spreads to also be a deal for the commoners. 
by the 17th century, this is beginning to be a real power struggle. And I was very struck years ago when uh, I was uh, instructed by uh, one of the great students of the American Revolution's intellectual framework, Gordon Wood at Brown, who, who said to me, you have to go back and study the English Civil War. He said that the arguments of the English Civil War, the reaction to Cromwell's dictatorship, begins to set a pattern of very ferociously defending liberty and the rule of law against tyranny that begins to be ingrained in, in English conversation. And your, your guest lecturer next week, Michael Barone, has written a terrific small book on the Glorious Revolution of 1688, in which he's making the same point. He's describing James II seeking to establish absolutist power, uh, really looking at Louis XIV and looking at other European monarchs and thinking, gee, why can't I have the kind of absolute power they have? And the rea and it was combined with the sense that he was Catholic, the country was largely Protestant. So you have all these different tensions building. And then you get uh, the Dutch prince who, who is coming from a country that has such a thoroughly screwed up governing system that almost nobody can make it work. And the Dutch pride themselves on being this little bastion of self-government in which the oligarchy protects themselves but through all sorts of constant arguments and pettiness and cheapness. And so when William arrives in the Glorious Revolution, he arrives with a sense of the limitations of kingship. And he is himself comfortable manipulating the parliament rather than trying to run over it. And so you begin to get into charters and agreements that create a very deep framework. This is where Locke's writing is engaged, and this is why you have all these people writing this stuff, because they're trying to figure out, we don't want to go back to the English Civil War. That was horrible. We don't want to go to a Cromwellian dictatorship. That was terrible. We don't want to see European absolutism. That violates who we are as English. And so you begin to get this nationalist sense of liberty that is actually deeply tied into the sense of being English. Now, and I say this because I'm, I'm of Scots and Irish background and the English were not nearly so kind to my relatives. Uh, <laughs> started as, in fact, uh, people to be subordinated and, if necessary, killed because they didn't understand it. Uh, so you get this period where they're sending people to the New World. Now, somebody once said the most important thing to understand about America is we're the people who left and the Europeans are the people who didn't. And that there's almost this pattern. You're getting very aggressive, very risk-taking people. They come here in very small boats. If you ever go in, in, in to, to uh, Williamsburg or to Jamestown and you, you, you see the size of the boats that came across the Atlantic, you understand why when the first permanent colony was established, they stopped uh, at Cape Horn and they put up a cross to thank God for having gotten across the Atlantic. I mean, they were really shaken by uh, how hard it was to get here. So when they got here, they were in a new world, and they felt it was a new world. There's a famous story of uh, Captain John Smith, who opens a letter to discover he's been made in charge of the colony by the people who paid for the colony. This was a private enterprise operation. Um, and it's one of the things I hearken back to in thinking about alternative ways of organizing some of our great adventures like space, because these colonies were being founded <clears throat> by private entrepreneurs with grants from the king. And the king doesn't have the power and the bureaucracy to do it, so he says, here, you go see if you can make it work. So Smith is put in charge. The aristocrats who are there come to Smith and say to him, we've already paid our way over here. You cannot make us work. Uh, we're aristocrats. And as I always tell my liberal friends, it's ironic. The people who don't want to work are the aristocrats, not the poor. And Smith looks at him and he says, look, we don't have a big enough surplus of production in the, in the new world to take care of you, but I can't make you work. You're right. You signed this document. So here's the deal. If you don't work, you won't eat, which is actually a paraphrase of, of uh, Paul. Uh, St. Paul writes a similar uh, paragraph. Um, they, talk, they think about it for a couple of hours, come back and say, okay, well, talk, tell us some more about this work stuff. This is the beginning of the, the whole American DNA that is very work-related, very self-reliant, very acquisitive. I mean, we've always been a country that wanted to have private property rights. Jefferson initially wrote, not the right to pursue happiness, but the right to private property in the first draft of the Declaration of Independence. We've always said, and the reason is, if you have private property rights, no tyranny can take away from you what is yours. The rule of law begins to be protected from the smallest property up. It's not protected by the largest theory down. So this is the context in which you see the, the development of these ideas of freedom. Gradually, the, the uh, founding fathers are all, remember, these people are inheriting 
from 1607, by the time they're starting to really argue seriously with Great Britain around 1770, they're inheriting 160 years of practice where they're, they're routinely governing themselves. Washington, who starts very early in life on the frontier, and one of the books I someday want to write is Washington as a very young man on the frontier because it's never been, never really been studied enough. This is a guy who goes out at 16 or 17 as a surveyor. He is in, in he's, he is in the Wild West, which back then is Western Virginia. He then engages in leading military expeditions, the first of which is a disaster, the second of which is Braddock's expedition where, where they get slaughtered by the French and Indians. Um, he learns an immense amount about fighting along the frontier. He leads the Virginia militia in a successful anti-Indian and anti-French campaign. So Washington announces for the uh, for the legislature. He wants to go to Williamsburg to serve uh, in, in the provincial uh, assembly. And uh, the tradition was you bought... Uh, drinks for all of your neighbors, and uh, they then elected you. And Washington announced grandly that he was a military hero and, and above the uh, indignity of buying his neighbor's drinks, and he came last uh, because he had not understood the, the rules of the game of that era. The next time he ran, he bought more drinks than anybody in the history of Virginia. Uh, and from that point on, <laughs> so you have, you have to see these guys. I mean, they're, they're wonderful stories of Washington, for example, who who was this arguably the strongest man in the colonies or one of the strongest men in the colonies, that they would sit around in the taverns. If you've never been to Williamsburg, you have to go because you'll, you'll get a little flavor of what this was like. These are just people. They're not sitting around going, gee, I'll be a revolutionary or I'll be a historic figure. They're people. They like politics. They like solving problems. They like having a little bit of power. Uh, one of the great stories is that, that uh, Governor Byrd um, used to make money because he would bet strangers a shilling that Washington could break a walnut between his thumb and his first finger. Try it sometime at Christmas when you have lots of walnuts. You'll see you, it's virtually impossible. Washington was so physically strong, he'd break them. Uh, and, and, and so he, he was actually a more personable, he was a guy who sat around with the guys. He, he was somebody, and, and, but they began to notice this cloud on the horizon. The cloud comes from two directions. It comes, first of all, because the British monarchy is increasingly dictatorial and increasingly arrogant. And it comes second because the British governing class is increasingly successful and increasingly arrogant. Now, these are two different parallel problems. The rise of the British government in the 18th century, the drift, you have to understand that when, when William takes over in 1688, it's a very weak central monarchy. It remains a relatively weak central monarchy for a long time. The rise of the Hanoverians, bringing George to, to uh, Great Britain, begins to centralize the monarchy with a king who initially doesn't speak English and doesn't understand English rules and doesn't understand how the English think about themselves. And they have learned that you can manage the government by corruption. Now, corruption in their era does, isn't... We, we've reduced corruption to, did I bribe you? For them, corruption was public resources for something other than the public good. So I say, would you support my government? By the way, I happen to have a job in the Treasury. Uh, or I need to get this done, your cousin, I understand, needs to be an ambassador somewhere. All of these things begin to permeate the society. And what happens about uh, 1740 is there is an enormous intellectual explosion, uh, what is, which is called basically the, the Whig critique of the British government. And one of the arguments that, that uh, Gordon Wood in particular makes is that you cannot understand the American revolutionaries unless you understand that they are, they are the Whig critique. They, they are taking up exactly the critique that the Whigs had. Now, I'll give, I'm going to give you two examples of this. The Whigs are deeply criticizing large government, and they're saying large government is inherently corrupt government. You inevitably end up with, with favoritism. You in, inevitably end up with the centralized power dominating, and it's wrong. It's a violation of the concept of the rule of law. It's a violation of the concept that our private property rights should be fair, uh, because now we're being taxed in order to give power and money to people who aren't us and, and to do it in a way that's unfair. And it gets to be a very bitter fight. And remember, this is still an era when you have to be very careful how you phrase things, uh, because to overtly criticize what is, quote, the king's government is to criticize the king. And it's not far from there to treason. And it's not far from there to getting hung. So there is a, there's a fairly delicate game underway. One of the things I recommend all of you do is read Addison's play, Cato. Uh, Cato is a play about Cato uh, the Younger, who refuses to give in to Caesar. 
not only flees Caesar during during the uh, Civil War and goes all the way over to North Africa, his son is killed by Caesar. And Caesar eventually finds him, gets to him and says, look, if you'll just accept that I'm the leader, then you'll get to live the rest of your life happily. I'll give you honors. I'll give you money. It's important to validate my government that you concede. And Cato says, no, I'd rather die a free man than live having put my knee down to you. Now, what makes it interesting is Cato is Washington's favorite play. He reads it and rereads it and rereads it. Uh, we did. I did a novel on, on Washington called Valley Forge. Uh, it was Bill Fortune in which uh, it turned out that the officers actually performed Cato's play in the uh, bed-breaking building, uh, which they used at night for entertainment during Valley Forge. So it's that it's that deep in Washington's being. There's a sense of nobility. It's why in another novel I did, uh, To Try Man's Souls, which is about Washington crossing the Delaware. Uh, and by the way, if you've not been to Mount Vernon, all of you have to go to Mount Vernon. You cannot understand Washington uh, without having seen Mount Vernon, and you can't understand America without understanding Washington. So there's, there's a scene, they, they, they did this wonderful small movie. <clears throat> because I want you to get in your head what, what America came from in terms of George Washington. Washington, as a young man, is out there on the frontier. He surrenders for necessity, which is worth you visiting sometime because as somebody who's at a school that uh, teaches military tactics, you'll understand. Fort Necessity is built down in, in the bottom of a, of a valley where every surrounding hill dominates it. Nobody who knew anything about military affairs would have done it. Washington knew nothing at 19 or 20 about military affairs. He screwed up. Right? Somebody once said Washington made many mistakes once, but they never saw him make the same mistake twice. So Washington surrenders. He goes back home. He actually writes a pamphlet explaining why he surrenders. He's now asked to, head to, to be the senior colonial advisor to, to uh, the Braddock's expedition, which leaves Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Remember, the West back then is, is Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, he is marching West, and he's saying to Braddock, you know, I personally would not advise marching four in a row in bright red uniforms down the road. Uh, we tend to cheat. And the French Indians are going to fire from behind trees. And you're just setting up a big target field. And, and this is really important in terms of how Washington fights the American Revolution. Because Braddock says to him, you're obviously a colonial. You don't understand British European tactics. This is a great professional army. We don't fight like guerrillas. We're not going to do the things you do. They wouldn't have used guerrilla, by the way. That's a word that's invented in Spain in the early 19th century. But the, we're not going to fight like bandits. Uh, we're going to march the middle. Well, of course, exactly what Washington suggested would happen. They get hit from ambush from every side. Braddock is killed almost at the very opening of the battle. Washington is the senior officer remaining. Washington rallies, this is like 1,500 troops. He rallies all the troops, and he gets them off the field with, without having a total massacre. Washington has four horses shot out from under him. I'm sorry, he has two horses shot out from under him. He has four bullet holes in his coat at the end of the day. Ten years later, he runs into an Indian chief at a powwow, and the chief says to him, God must want you for something. Every one of us is trying to shoot you. You're this, you're this huge guy. <laughs> he said, I personally shot at you six times. I do not understand why you're here. So I tell you this background. So you, so you get to um, 1776. Washington's army has won, uh, driven the British out of, of uh, Boston. They feel pretty good about themselves. They get to Brooklyn. They are beaten by the British army. And a divine intervention occurs. This is, this is Washington's language. He said, Providence intervened. The reason was the, the British Navy is, is in the East River. Their back is to the river. The British army is going to massacre them. A huge fog comes in. Nobody can see anything. The Marblehead fishermen, who will later take Washington across the Delaware, row the entire army at night across the river, escaping the British. Now, there are 30,000 effectives in Brooklyn. They lose in Brooklyn. They lose in Manhattan. They lose in White Plains. They lose in the Palisades. They're driven across New Jersey. By the week before Christmas, they're down to 2,500 effectives, a third of whom do not have shoes. They're wearing burlap bags, leaving a trail of blood when they march. The generals meet with Washington. And at Valley Forge, I mean, at Mount Vernon, there's great crashing back and forth between Washington with Braddock, Washington, and the Council of War. 
And the generals all say to him, oh, we're in deep, deep trouble. Uh, we don't know what to do. There aren't many of us left. Washington says, we've got this idea. We're going to cross the river at night in, in, in the ice during a snowstorm. We're going to march nine miles at night. We're going to surprise the Hessians. We're going to capture all of them. It's going to be a great victory. It'll, it'll revive the morale of the, of the war. Uh, and it, it just requires a three-pronged assault across an icy river at night. And every single one of his generals goes, we can't do that. And finally, Washington says, look, if we don't win something, this army will disappear in another two or three weeks. When the army disappears, the revolution will be over. When the revolution is over, everyone in this room will be hung. Therefore, we have nothing to risk. Because we have certain death on one side and a chance to win on the other. We're crossing the river. Now, Washington is somebody who's actually very subtle. He understands that morale, the, the Napoleonic phrase, morale is to material as three is to one. So anytime you have a choice, if you have an army that has high morale and low equipment or an army with low morale and high equipment, always pick high morale. So <clears throat> Washington had asked Thomas Paine to write a new pamphlet. He'd, he'd written Common Sense, which is the most widely read interpretation of the Declaration of Independence. Washington then got him to write uh, The Crisis. Uh, and, and Washington actually has his officers reading from The Crisis. These are the times that try men's souls. And when walking through it, three or four opening pages are just magnificent explanation of where they were and why only courage would save freedom. They crossed the river that night. Their password is victory or death. And they meant it. They marched nine miles. They find that there's a, there are two ravines. They thought there was one. There were two. They have to manhandle. The, the artillery has to go down and then back up. And so you end up with them four hours late. They have a driving snowstorm from their rear. By, if you were wargaming this, if you were doing this in a classroom, you would have the Hessians mobilized and they would annihilate Washington about 8 o'clock that morning. Because the snowstorm is so enormous, they don't post guards. Because in a European army, it's impossible to maneuver. Here's part of the problem. Europeans have coerced soldiers. You can't let them out in a, in a, in a snowstorm because they'll, they'll desert. So you, you're really trapped into fighting in open weather where your sergeants can keep track of your men. Americans are fighting for freedom, plus Americans are all deer hunters. They just thought of this as a snowstorm. They've been out in snowstorms their whole life. The result is they absolutely stun the Hessians, who are trapped in the, in the various houses they're bivouacking in. They capture 800 Hessian professional soldiers at the cost of one American. They, they run like crazy for the river, get across the river. Within two weeks, word of the, of the victory has brought 15,000 volunteers. Washington drives the British across northern New Jersey, and the war has been saved for the moment. Now, remember, this, and this is one of the points I'm building up for you to understand contextually the people who are doing this, people who give you the Constitution, who give you the Federalist Papers. He's in the field for eight years. He spends one week in Mount Vernon. I wear, this is Washington, I don't think you see it or not down there. This is Washington's commander-in-chief flag from Valley Forge. And I wear it to remind myself and other people. When the Founding Fathers meet at the Constitutional Convention, and they write commander-in-chief, the guy presiding over the convention was the commander-in-chief. Now, why are they doing all this? They're doing all this because they're really pissed off. And the reason they're so angry is they have grown up accustomed to what they thought of as the natural rights of Englishmen. They all think of themselves as English. They all think that they're part of this extraordinary worldwide empire. They identify with the parliament. They even identify with the king in the House of Lords. And around 1770, the British, out of arrogance and ignorance, begin to behave in a way that says to the Americans, no, you're not us. So there's a great line that, that Benjamin Franklin, who goes to London to petition for the provinces, left American Englishman and returned an American because he did, and he lived there for years <clears throat> because he realized that even though he was a world-class scientist, independently wealthy, a very successful businessman, a writer of considerable note, a founder of various institutions, he was a provincial and he would never ever be accepted in British high society. And so he said, fine, you want to make me an American? I'm an American. Now that I'm an American, I want my independence because I don't trust you to govern me. And so around 1770, starting with the, the Boston Massacre, you really begin to get a ramping up, and you get committees of correspondence. 
And you get all sorts of, this is one of the fascinating things that people don't cover very well. This is not some highly centralized, organized product. This is a mass movement. Uh, for example, five months before the first shot is fired at uh, Concord, Lexington, the uh, New Hampshire folks, folks go to the British fort in New Hampshire, surround it, and they, as a very small garrison and a very junior officer who looks out and says, okay, I quit. And this small garrison leaves, leaving all the guns and all the ammunition to the New Hampshire militia. Now, it doesn't become the first shot heard around the world because there were no shots fired. The guy just surrendered. And that didn't bubble up. It didn't become part of the folklore. But in fact, New Hampshire also writes its first state constitution before the Declaration of Independence. Because they're out here in the wilderness, they're going, we're not paying attention. London? Remember, London is about as far away as the moon. I mean, London is forever in a sailing ship. And to go from London to Boston and then go from Boston to, to Manchester or Concord, New Hampshire, I mean, this is real work. So they're kind of going, we don't care what the British think. Who are the British? I've never, I've never met a British lord. So <clears throat> you then get to the British now have this escalating crisis. The Americans got, are starting to know each other. They have committees of correspondence. They're beginning to get together. They're driven together by one common theme. We have, this is where it's Berkey, and I agree with, with, with Mallory's point. We have inherited rights that are coming to us from God and that are a fundamental contract. And you, the king, and your government are breaking our rights. So from their standpoint, the revolutionary behavior was the king and his government. Because they were simply living out what they already believed. And in a sense, you know, Burke and, and uh, Adam Smith are both remarkable, and, and modern intellectuals don't have a clue about this. Um, neither Burke nor Adam Smith are theoreticians. They are observers of a world they're codified. They're trying to explain what's actually happening around them. And, there, and, and the French Revolution is a total mess, as is the Soviet Revolution uh, and, and, and all other totalitarian revolutions, because it's an effort to impose an ordered theory on people, whereas the American and English traditions are to grow organically. One of the best small books in this, by the way, is Gertrude Himmelfarb's uh, Three Enlightenments, which is a study of the Scottish, French, and English Enlightenments, and points out how much religious behavior there is in the English Enlightenment as compared to the, the French is anti-religious. The, 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 uh, the English Enlightenment is very, very heavily imbued by religion, and particularly by Methodism and the Wesley brothers, which then leads to the anti-slavery movement. So, so in this point, here, here's what the Americans would have told you in the mid-1770s. The royal government's corrupt. The royal government is violating our rights. Interestingly, not well, the number one complaint is no taxation without representation. The number two complaint is judges who are, who are dictators on behalf of the king. Uh, there are more complaints about judges than any other single problem except taxation. And why is taxation so big? I mean, it's ironic. The British, who don't understand at all what's going on, and this is, this is how you get into establishment revolutionary environments. The British are doing things that make perfect. They're going, wow, this is our logic train. We paid for the French and Indian War, which made you safe. You're now safe. So shouldn't you help pay down some of the debt that we ran up to make you safe? The Americans are going, no, actually, that wasn't the deal. We fought, we bled, uh, we provided volunteers. You're an empire. You behave like an empire. Why are you, why are you getting money from us? You're a rich empire. You're London. <clears throat> Instead of saying, gee, this is a political conversation, maybe we'd better find a way to talk with each other. What the British did, the imperial government says, we are going to coerce you, which is why you get, by the way, coercion acts. Just think about the title. You know, these guys are out here saying, we're going to teach you, we're, we're the greatest empire on the planet, and you're a bunch of provincials. Now, why are they doing this? Because they've done it everywhere. They've coerced the Irish. The last great massacre is in 1693. Uh, they've just finished coercing the Scots with the Battle of Culloden in 1744. They made it a, uh, a, draw, a hanging, drawing, and quartering offense to wear a kilt. Um, they, had, uh, they had crushed the Welsh earlier. Uh, here's a new group. They're the provincials. I mean, if we can break the Irish and the Scotch and the Welsh, who are these people who call themselves American? We'll just have to teach them. So they set out to teach them. And, and this is why, by the way, the Second Amendment ends up being so important. Uh, in a terrific book called Paul Revere's Ride, it's pointed out that the British Army had routinely coerced peasants. And they marched out of Britain in April of seven, out of Boston in April of 1775 to coerce peasants. 
except they didn't find peasants. They found citizens. And they didn't find people who were unarmed. They found an armed, trained militia, which had spent over six months preparing for the battle. And they got beaten badly. And they had lost men all the way back to Boston. And now they had a crisis. Because now how can you be the greatest empire in the world and have a rabble in America stand up to you? And that's how this process begins. Now, what do Americans think they're doing? They are protecting themselves from offensive attack. It's very important to understand this. They're not on offense. They're not asking anything new. They are defending the rights that they've been living for 160 years. And they're saying to the British government, what are you doing to us? We're just being us. We've always had the right to vote. We've always had the right to decide on taxation. We've always had the right to solve our problems locally. You're sending us these foreigners, because from their standpoint, the British judges are foreigners. You're sending us foreigners to judges. They're confiscating our houses. They're imposing troops to live in our homes. You're taking away our money. And here's the underlying core thing, which is at the heart of this. It goes back to Cato's, Ad Addison's Cato. <clears throat> if I concede that you have the arbitrary power to take a penny from me, then I have conceded that you have the arbitrary power to take everything from me. And in a sense, if you read Lincoln on slavery in the 1850s, Lincoln is capturing the rhythm of the founding fathers' argument with the English. And so they're saying, so, so I can't allow you to cross this line. And here's what it leads to, because you have, you have two different conversations underway. The British say, aha, the Americans are cheap. So what we'll do is we will give tea to the East India Company. The East India Company, in return for monopoly, will reduce the price of tea. So although it will still have a tax, it will now be cheaper than it was. Therefore, the Americans will have no complaint because, after all, tea will now be cheap. Well, the Americans said, wait a second. The argument isn't about money. The argument is about rights. And if you keep the price that we'd rather pay more for tea without a tax than less for tea with a tax, which totally confused the British, and that's why you have the Boston Tea Party. They're making a moral point. They are not going to tolerate British taxes being seductively brought in with a monopoly which lowers prices. This is now a political fight over the very nature of our rights. And that's what then leads to the Declaration of Independence. Now, there's a very important thing to recognize about the Founding Fathers, who are truly one of the most remarkable groups, if not the most remarkable secular group in history. They begin by saying we hold these truths to be self-evident. These were pretty pious people. A uh, surprising number of them are actually preachers. They're not trying to find a theory. They're not trying to find a philosophy. They're not trying to find an ideology. They're trying to understand the truth by which humans are able to govern themselves. And they say we're all created equal. All men are created equal, which at a time when you have king, I mean, think about how radical this is. This document arrives in London. And the king and his ministers and the dukes and the, and the earls and the barons and the uh, lords and the, are all sitting around reading this document that says all men are created equal. They just drove a knife into the heart of the British hierarchical structure and every European hierarchical structure. Now, and we are endowed by our creator. This is a direct assault on kingship. The historic medieval system was power came from God to the king. I mean, you can read both Louis XIV and Frederick the Great. I mean, uh, power comes from God to the king. The king loans power to those he favors. But the king is absolute. The Americans just said the exact opposite. Power comes from God to the citizen. So in America, the citizen is sovereign. Now, they didn't think they were saying something radical. They were saying something self-evident. This is how they've been living for six generations. Why wouldn't you believe this? And the rights are unalienable. And that meant no judge, no king, in the modern world, no president, no bureaucrat can get between us and God. Now, I'm giving you this background because what I want you to see is psychological. These are people living in a culture of liberty in a culture of practical common sense, in a culture of getting things done. They, they ultimately absorb Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations, and earlier, a, a very small number of them uh, absorbed his book uh, on the theory of moral sentiments, which is infinitely harder to read than The Wealth of Nations. But 
they, but they certainly, they, the Hamiltons uh, and people like Hamilton all read The Wealth of Nations. And they sort of understood this model, this new model of a, a free society with a free market with an invisible hand. And they're amazingly practical people. I mean, this is where our modern academic classes are such a mess. These, these were not folks sitting around thinking in the abstract. They're sitting around going, okay, what is going to work? And they're blending two things. What are the historical truths and what are the practical requirements? And how do we blend them? Now, their declaration is a freestanding document. It's an idealistic document. Uh, it, it states the why of America. Then they have their first cut at the what of America, the Articles of Confederation. They do not work very well. Valley Fork they vividly illustrate what a mess it was, how impossible the Congress was, how incompetent the system was. But it holds together enough to win the war. Washington goes home, ready to be a private citizen. George II, King George says, if he gives up power, he'll be the greatest man of the century. Uh, Washington's officers come to him at Newburgh and say, you know, let's mutiny, let's take over the government. They're not paying us. They're, they're, they're impossible. The Congress is relevant. Washington comes to their meeting in a schoolroom, pulls out his glasses slowly to illustrate that he has grown old in the service of his country, and reads a letter. And he says in the decisive turning point in American history, I did not rebel against George III to become George I, period. The officers all say, got it, we're for you. He goes home. The system isn't working. His friends say to him, we've got to do something. He says something very profound. He says, we're not ready. The American people have not grown tired enough. And so he waits several more years. They then meet and decide that they should, they should amend the Articles of Confederation. They gather in Philadelphia. Washington presides. And in 55 days of closed meetings with no press, they virtually <laughs> on the side, you know, the Articles are such a total mess. Remember, now, Washington spent eight years trying to get the Articles to work. So you have a guy who both has the prestige of the revolutionary leader and the experience of having tried it to do it. After a couple of days, they go, this is stupid. We're not going to reform the Articles of Confederation. We're writing a new document. Now, this is, in fact, a, a coup d'etat. They didn't have the authority to do this, but they said, we are the leadership class of the country, and we're going to do what we think is right. And then, but then they said something that's, that's central, uh, and I got in trouble back in May for trying to get this point across. They then say, although we're the leadership group and we're going to go ahead and write this document, it will only work if the people ratify it. So we now have an obligation to go out and say to the people, this is what we believe we should do, but we cannot do it without your approval. And so they go into every single state and they wage a campaign. They write the most elegant campaign pamphlet in history. And, and, and some of you just pick up the Federalist Papers, look at it and think to yourself, in a country where only a third of the people were literate, this was a campaign pamphlet, not a 30-second TV commercial. An enormously complex, sophisticated book, which came out as a series of newspaper articles for the purpose of winning an election. And they slowly, gradually win it. And by the way, the people who were opposing them were very honorable people. Uh, I mean, Patrick Henry, for example, is the leader of the Anti-Federalist in Virginia. And, he, and, and the argument of the anti-federalist is very simple. You do not want centralized power. It will inevitably over time grow too big, too corrupt, too tyrannical. And I would suggest to you that, that, that uh, Patrick Henry would look at the current Obama administration. He'd look at the recent ruling against the Catholic Church. He'd look at the $2 trillion in deficits. He'd look at the Solyndra corruption. And he would say to you, see, I told you. It took a couple hundred years, but the mess has now occurred. And so you can make an argument that the anti-federalists stuck closer to the Whig critique than did the Federalists, but the Federalists were trying to solve a really big problem. How do you have just enough government to be effective and not enough government to be a tyranny? And that is the, the permanent balance of tension in the American system. Now, I just want to make a couple more points about this. There's a, there's a real disadvantage in the modern academic world because we, we segment knowledge into narrow frameworks. So a political scientist doesn't spend much time looking at the cultural framework within which the particular document exists. The American Constitution, 
was designed for a voluntaristic society of people who were profoundly religious and who were bounded by their culture to behave in certain ways. All of the founding fathers believed this. Uh, I cap captured it in a small book uh, in a movie uh, called Rediscovering God in America. And when you go back and you, and you context it, if you, go talk, if you look at Tocqueville, for example, when you contextualize the culture within which they were operating, they had certain invisible assumptions about life. They assumed that people would have some sense of virtue. Uh, they assumed that there would be some overriding religious belief system. Uh, I mean, Washington describes it. John Adams describes it. Even Jefferson describes it. Uh, and they all have this sense, you know, the, in, in the um, Northwest Ordinance of 1787, they, uh, they write religion morality and knowledge being important. It is essential that we have public schools. Recently at the Capitol Visitor Center, some nice uh, secular staff person cut out the first three words and put up knowledge being essential. But that's not what the founding fathers said. They said religion, morality, and knowledge being essential. The reason I tell you that is to try to understand the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Federalist Papers without contextualizing them both historically in the people and the understanding that surrounded them and culturally in the assumptions about society and then pragmatically in the behavior of these people. These are amazingly practical people. Remember that Franklin not only discovers electricity, invents the lightning rod, invents the bi bifocal glasses, invents the Franklin stove, which to this day is very, very efficient. Uh, becomes first postmaster general of the colonies, writes an annual almanac, is a very successful printer, is a world-renowned scientist. Um, you know, he's a practical guy. So Jefferson is arguably the leading intellectual American of his generation, uh, although you, know, you could also argue in some ways he's a dilettante. But uh, he's a dilettante of enormous range. He collects fossils. He sends uh, Lewis and Clark to the West. He uh, studies uh, nature. He is an architect. I mean, he does many things. Washington imports from Spain a new breed of sheep because he wants to improve, and, and he's very interested in, in what we would call genetics, uh, and they just call it breeding. But Washington works very hard at being successful as a businessman, uh, creates, for example, a whiskey distillery to, make, to, to develop cash. He has plenty of corn, he just doesn't have any cash. Uh, and he found that if you turn corn into whiskey, you got cash. Um, so there are a whole series of these, these guys are all being very practical. And so you have this very unusual moment in history where their historic background gave them a sense of rights which were being threatened. And they were actually conservatives fighting to retain the rights which the emerging British tyranny was threatening. They were culturally committed to a limited government with a big citizenship. In a sense, they would have argued, you want big citizens and small government, you don't want big government and small citizens. And, and uh, again, uh, Gordon Wood describes this brilliantly when he says, as a practical matter, no government of that era was powerful enough to, to deliver things. It had to rely on the local gentry and the local merchant class and, and people of local authority to sustain authority because the government itself didn't have the force, didn't have a big bureaucratic structure, didn't have the money. So you have an organic system almost by definition because they can't build it any other way. Um, finally, these are people who have a sense of, of permanence. To a degree that's kind of amazing, here they are at the edge of the North American continent in rebellion against the greatest empire of their time. And they're trying to write for eternity. Uh, there's a reason that Lincoln is so much their spiritual and intellectual heir, because Lincoln's trying to think through for eternity. What are the principles which govern human beings? What is it that we should expect of ourselves? There's a great line from one of the revolutionary leaders who said, be worthy of yourself. And they had this whole sense. It goes back to Cato. I'd rather, I would rather die free than live a slave. Uh, and they had this very deep sense of, of virtue in, in the Roman tradition, uh, the, the sense that you had to be somehow a person worthy of respect. And they didn't mean by that the father of the country. They meant everybody like that. There's a, there's a wonderful line in uh, The Last of the Mohicans, the modern version, uh, with Daniel Day-Lewis, where the British officer and, and he are arguing, and he's saying, I'm not going to go fight in the war. And the British officer is saying, but, but you, you can't, how can you leave? 
And he said, I'm going to go to Kentucky. And finally, British officer in exasperation says, how can you go to Kentucky? Now, he's asking a moral question. And then and, and the, the deer slayer says, you face north, turn left, and walk 500 miles. Okay. He's giving a definitively American answer, which is, I reject all of your assumptions. I am a free person. Now, of course, he loves the girls who has to go back and save her, so he, in fact, gets involved in the war. That's a different story. But the underlying notion, this, which the British wrote about all the time, this very stiff neck pride, this, this sense that, you know, we are a free people, and we would rather you kill us as a free people than bend a knee to you and become your servants. Uh, I would argue that that actually had grown out of the experience of the time. It has then been driven into our DNA. We're in danger of losing it with the rise of the modern welfare state and the scale of modern bureaucracy. Uh, and that's one of the great issues of our generation is are, are we, in fact, going to continue to be Americans in the sense that Paul Johnson described them? Or are we gradually going to become um, subjects in the European tradition rather than citizens in the American tradition? And, and the key is, is central. Citizens control the government, and the government is their servant. Subjects are controlled by the government, and they are the servants of the government. Uh, it is a fundamental dividing line. It's a dividing line which all of the founding fathers believed was real. They all believed that historically they had inherited citizenship and that it was the British government which was acting as a revolutionary force in trying to take it away from them. And that's why you end up in, in the model we have today. I would argue that that organic conservatism, not, not some abstract intellectual theory, but the organic conservatism, that our rights come from God, that we are a community of equally sovereign people, that we have an obligation to solve things, and we shape government to fit those things that we conclude government can solve better, but we do not owe government. Government, in fact, is, a, is subordinate to us. This entire model is an organic, cultural, historical model that, that can be carried back to, uh, into the British tradition, but that really flourishes in the uh, late uh, 17th, early 18th century is the Whig tradition, and then gets, becomes captured in the DNA both of American government and of um, American citizenship and American culture. Tocqueville captured it remarkably well in the 1830s, uh, and I think he was stunned by it. We were different. We, we were Americans in a way that meant we weren't just the western wing of European civilization. We were something new, uh, and that's why we can absorb people from anywhere, because you can learn the culture of being an American. And where, where the political scientists are just goofy is it's not the structure. The structure is just this, this, this fabric around within which the American culture operates. But it's the culture that really has made the most difference. And one of the great tragedies for your generation is we don't teach enough American history, and so we're beginning to produce kind of an amnesia about what makes us American. It's part of why I've written so many novels in this area, because I wrote people to get engaged in looking at who we are and understanding who we are, and they have to get a feeling of the rhythm of being an American in order to truly understand uh, why this happened. I'll, I'll just close with, with uh, one last observation, uh, which gives you a flavor of how deep this is. When the British were conquering the Scots, uh, they drove many of them to flee. And they fled uh, often to Philadelphia and then came down the Great Wagon Road uh, and ended up in uh, South Carolina and North Carolina along the Appalachians. One of them is a young man at uh, 13 years of age in South Carolina named Andrew Jackson. Now, three things are happening around him. Uh, and if you haven't visited them, it's worth your, your going to two of these places. One is that at 13 years of age, he, his face is slashed by a British cavalryman, and he carries the rest of his life a scar from what he would have said was a British oppressor. So, so you have this really deep sense of toughness and hostility that's personal. These are not abstract theories. The Battle of Calpens is one of those miraculous battles that's worth your looking at, uh, because part of what's happened to the British in the South is they're just gradually getting ground to pieces. And at Calpens, the American militia turn and, and uh, decisively defeat a British unit uh, in a way which sends a shock through the entire British system in North America. At King's Mountain, uh, 
uh, what happens is they repeat Washington's mistake of being down in a valley surrounded by high hills. And word goes out across uh, western Tennessee, Kentucky, uh, and uh, the Carolinas that the people who defeated us at Culloden are now available. And the slaughter at, at Kings Mountain is truly bitter and personal. And it's, it's a fascinating part of this war that the war in the South is much more personal than the war in the North. In the North, you have a much more regular army fight. The South, what you have is all these folks who had fled the British and hated them and their children, grandchildren, all see this as a moment of personal revenge. And so you have built into our DNA a toughness that is very, very striking. Uh, in fact, there's, a, there's an essay uh, by a very famous American political scientist in which he argues that there's a Jacksonian tradition of toughness and violence that is at the heart of our foreign policy. Uh, and and uh, Jackson is well worth your reading because since he's not an intellectual and he's not a literary figure, historians tend to underrate him. But in fact, he personified this frontier mentality. And remember, the frontier, and, and Schlesinger's work on the age of Jackson ca captures this perfectly. The frontier isn't just the wilderness. The frontier is also small shopkeepers. It's, 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 uh, it's people who work with their hands in the cities. It's, it's people who are sort of lower middle class who are, and there's a deep American tradition of toughness uh, that goes back to this period. So uh, in closing, let me just say what you had is this amazing confluence. You had a history which gave people a sense of absolute security that all they were doing was defending their rights. They were not in any way trying to change things. They were trying to sustain things. You had a very clumsy British government that did not realize uh, how much out of sync with the culture it was, and which was clumsily forcing people to choose. And with each passing year, more and more people chose independence and chose freedom over subordination to a tyranny. You had very practical leaders who were, at the one hand, very intellectual, on the other hand, astonishingly pragmatic, and who could weave those two together into a system that actually worked and has continued to work for uh, you know, almost uh, 250 years now. Uh, finally, uh, you had a period of learning. This is where our, some of our modern micro-critiquing is just stupid. They didn't get it right. Washington loses a lot of battles. This is a long, hard process. The Articles of Confederation don't work very well. Many states write three or four constitutions. But what they do have is a general sense of direction, a general sense of principle, and a commitment that together they're going to keep changing things until it works. Uh, it is one of the most remarkable achievements in human history, uh, clearly the most remarkable in terms of government, uh, and uh, well worth studying. And I think at its heart it is the definition of American conservatism, the application of principle to the real world in order to affect a better life uh, with a realization that it involves both universal rights and practical everyday realities. Wow, that was outstanding.